a third of the world's land area is desert. It is a place of harsh beauty and terrifying extremes, veering from searing heat by day to freezing cold at night. Immense winds blow over them. Flash floods rip through them. The intense heat can dry out a man's body and reduce it to dust in days. The Sahara is the largest desert in the world, covering half of Africa. It is equal in area to the United States. Those who live on its margins regard it as others would a mighty ocean. Those who enter carelessly pay with their lives. In 1955, a group of four Britons, en route from Kenya to England, set out to cross the Sahara in a small station wagon. Survivor science recreates their tragic journey. The organizer of the 8,000-mile journey was Alan Cooper, a Kenyan farmer. Like many British colonials of his generation, he had an attitude of self-confidence, even arrogance. This was not his first trip across Africa. 20 years earlier, he had been the first person to cross the Sahara in a small car. Now he planned to make the trip once again to visit his aging mother in England. Even as long ago as 1955, there were regulations for vehicles entering the desert. They had to have a minimum ground clearance and not be overloaded. They had to carry basic equipment such as additional spare tires, shovels, and above all, substantial water supplies. Alan Cooper was aware of these regulations, but ignored them. He had run the gauntlet of this desert once before and succeeded. He would do so again. He was also a man with a strong belief in his own invincibility. <laughs> Together with Cooper were three others, none of whom had ever met before. Muriel Frieda Taylor was an English school teacher in her mid-fifties. She had been on vacation in Kenya when she heard of Cooper's trip. Craving adventure, she lied about her age to ensure she got a seat. We always tend to look on the, the black side, Barbara, a bit, don't you? <laughs> Barbara Duthi worked for the Kenyan government as a zoologist. She had some leave coming and had intended working her passage to England aboard a boat. However, doubts about the captain and the condition of his vessel made her choose the safer option, an overland journey in the company of Alan Cooper, a man with a proven track record. As a zoologist, Barbara was a keen observer of natural history and was always on the lookout for wildlife. She saw many animals from the speeding car, but there was no time to stop. Alan Cooper insisted on forging ahead as quickly as possible. Undaunted, Barbara filmed much of the trip. Cooper pushed on relentlessly. He had his reasons. The rainy season would soon be upon them, and the authorities would close the roads. He did not want to risk being turned back. The final member of the group was 17-year-old Peter Barnes. The journey was his mother's idea. She hoped the trip would make a man of him. He took photographs and kept a daily diary. Peter's diary and photographs, along with Barbara's film, provide a unique chronicle of the journey. We've made good progress through East Africa, averaging about 200 miles a day. We passed through towns and villages, through forests and across great rivers. We can never stop for as long as we'd like to. Mr. Cooper's schedule is very demanding. May 5th. After 21 days and over 3,000 miles, we have at last entered the deserts of French West Africa. 
The road is virtually non-existent, marked only by oil drums a mile apart. When the car is moving, the heat is tolerable, but as soon as we slow down, it becomes unbearable. We are becoming stuck in the sand with growing regularity. Alan hasn't brought a shovel, and it is often me who does the digging out. It's too exhausting to dig in the daytime, and the nights are cold. We're all getting pretty tired. May 9th. Our journey is fast becoming a ritual of unpacking to lighten the weight of the Morris, and constant digging. On May 10th, the group became stranded about 60 miles from the next well, which was in a village called Ingazam. They had only 10 pints of water left. Peter Barnes was the first to realize the seriousness of the situation. We are on a vast plateau surrounded by endless dunes. I can see no way out of our predicament except for me to go for help. So as not to cause panic, Peter chose his moment carefully and expressed his fears to Alan Cooper. He suggested that he leave the car and try to make it to Inguizam. Alan Cooper pointed out that it was 60 miles. Peter said he thought he could do it by walking in the cool of the night. Alan Cooper did not reject the idea, but realized that he could not send the young boy on such a mission. Perhaps as much out of guilt as gritty determination, he decided to go himself. Alan Cooper said he would set off alone to Ingezam, walking as Peter had planned in the cool of the night and sheltering during the day. Frida offered him some more of their water, but he declined it. No, 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 I've got, I've got plenty here. Good luck to you, old man. Take care. Good luck, Alan. He said farewell to the ladies, and after instructing Peter to look after them, he left. What they did not know was that the car had failed its inspection at the desert border point. The border patrol there had told Alan Cooper to turn back. He ignored them. Now the authorities were unaware of their journey. No one would be out looking for them. No one even knew they were there. Mr. Cooper has gone for help. We only have a few pints of water left. We're all thinking of him and the long walk he has, but he is our only hope. All our thoughts are with him. I think he's a very brave man. Frida, who had been drinking heavily throughout the journey, finished off the last of her whiskey. By sunrise, Alan Cooper had walked 20 miles and was near collapse. An oil drum marker offered the only shade in the scorching wilderness. We've been here for a day. We've rationed our water, but there's not much left. The heat is unbearable. I can feel it sapping my energy. We are growing weaker as each hour passes. I hope Mr. Cooper is all right. But Alan Cooper was far from all right. Totally exhausted, he had fallen asleep beside the oil drum. The intense sunlight had beaten down relentlessly upon the black steel. By the time he woke, he was badly burned and seriously dehydrated.
Another day passed. Time lost all meaning. Without water, they sat listlessly in the shade, preoccupied with their own thoughts. Of Alan Cooper, or help, there was no sign. Miraculously, Alan Cooper had been found lying face down in the sand by a passing military jeep. The patrol was escorting a Swiss couple in a Volkswagen, which had developed engine trouble. The gods had smiled on Alan Cooper and given him a second chance. His ordeal had taken its toll. It was now a different Alan Cooper who walked towards them. Well done, Peter. Well done, my boy. Well done. Go on. Oh, have some water. The Swiss couple looked on bemused by Alan Cooper's behavior. What now? What have we been through? No, no, we're nearly there. Despite what he had been through, he was adamant they should not turn back. He'd been through hell to get this far. They all had. And, he claimed, they didn't have all that far to go. It was only a matter of miles to Ingrizam. He'd done it once before, and he was, he said, damned well going to do it again. I got to do it again. Despite Alan Cooper's protestations, it was decided for their own safety they would all travel back in convoy to the town of Agades. To make more room in the tiny station wagon, Barbara traveled in the jeep. The three vehicles set off, retracing their route. All went well until the Volkswagen broke down once again. Barbara could only watch in disbelief as the car vanished into the distance. Peter, who was driving, concentrated on the sandy road ahead and did not notice the other vehicles behind him had stopped. The jeep was low on fuel and could not afford to go after them. Besides, the driver was certain Peter would stop when he realized he was not being followed. The small Morris station wagon traveled on into the desert, its passengers unaware they were alone once more. It was some time before Peter and Frida realized the Volkswagen and jeep were not following behind. Peter stopped the car and wanted to turn back, but Alan Cooper ordered them to keep driving. They weren't to stop, he insisted. They were to keep going. They were almost there. Reluctantly, Peter obeyed. Back at the Jeep, Barbara was becoming anxious. She tried to persuade the driver to go on, but he refused. Two days in the unmerciful heat, without water, had taken its toll. Exhausted and debilitated, Peter had mistaken the road and driven on the wrong side of a dune. It was only a matter of time before they were stuck in the sand again. Their tracks were hidden by the desert wind. They were utterly lost.
Mr. Cooper is in a very bad way. We have almost no water now. Thank goodness Barbara is safe. We hope she is getting help. But we don't know whether they've gone ahead or whether they're still behind us in trouble. Thank heavens one of our party will survive. Alan Cooper slipped in and out of consciousness. He was thirsty and demanded a cup of coffee. We'll have to wait until the truck catches us up. When Frida told him they had no water, he still insisted he be given a drink. Our supplies are all used up. Searching in the car, I managed to find a tin of pears which I gave to Mr. Cooper. He gulped the juice down like a hungry baby. Frida was so thirsty, she drank the juice from a tin of mushrooms in brine. Friday, May 13th, was the beginning of the end. Cooper died without regaining consciousness. Alan! Oh, please, Alan. Alan! Alan! In Alan Cooper's death, Peter saw his own fate. Barbara and the jeep driver had searched as best they could, but with night falling and fuel short, they gave up and returned to a goddess to get help. By 1.30 on the afternoon of May 15th, Frida was dead. Peter searched in the back of the car and managed to find his camera. This is the last photograph Peter took of the ill-fated trip. At 5.30 that same afternoon, a patrol of French legionnaires based in Agadis at last found the missing car. Peter Barnes was rushed to the military hospital in Agadis, where he made a full recovery. He completed his journey to England by air, arriving in London on June 16th. Barbara Duthie and Peter Barnes now live in Eastern Africa. Peter worked for the Kenyan government, but now at 60 years old is semi-retired. He lives with his wife and daughter near Lake Nakuru in Kenya. If anybody had said to us, you're going to have a serious problem in the middle of the desert and uh, you're going to die and everything like that, I don't think we'd have believed them. We simply had not the slightest idea what we're heading for and what was going to happen. 
At that time it was just a question of uh, an adventure, fun, something different getting across, which we thought was a piece of cake, but Alan had done it 20 odd years before and had very few problems at all. And with his assurance and his character and his cheerfulness and everything else, we were very happy. Alan Cooper's authority was never challenged by the group. They were unaware he had lied about the car's safety. I seem to remember we had a lot of respect for the way he decided to set off and walk for help, even though it was an awfully long walk in desert conditions. I think we were quite humbled by the fact that he did this. It was only later that we learned of uh, that refusal. We had, in fact, been refused to cross the desert, and Alan had perhaps misled us. But even then, I don't think I had any, any animosity against him at that stage, because after all, I was still alive. Although Peter was the youngest and perhaps the fittest of the group, it was a combination of his utter determination to survive and pure chance, which ultimately saved his life. I remember flashing the lights of the car, what was left of them, until the battery finally gave out altogether. And I just, I suppose, resigned myself to what appeared to be an inevitable fate, death. The French Foreign Legion had now been alerted, and they actually came to a spot about five or six miles away in the desert and decided to camp for the night, where a group of Tuaregs was also camped. And the Tuaregs had said to them, don't, whatever you do, go into that part of the desert. There are spirits there. We saw strange lights last night. Keep out of it. And they put two and two together and thought, maybe, just maybe, it could be the people we're looking for. So they up camp and came straight over, which was lucky for me because they reckoned I only had about an hour and a half left. Frida Taylor and Alan Cooper were buried in the desert where they had died. Their deaths shocked the world. For a time, at least, it reinforced in people's minds the dangers of the desert. The greatest danger is the life-sucking heat. To survive, man must first understand, then accept his physical limitations. 75% of the human body consists of water. In temperatures above 120 degrees Fahrenheit, the skin quickly burns and fries in its own fat. A loss of only two quarts of fluid decreases the body's efficiency by as much as 25%. The brain and essential organs quickly become irreversibly damaged. Some of those with the greatest understanding of the dangers posed by the desert are the military. They have learned from past mistakes. During the Second World War in North Africa, soldiers were trained to restrict their drinking. Many collapsed through heat exhaustion. More recently, during the Gulf War, the military was forced to develop ingenious techniques to cope with the desert's extremes. Sergeant Mike Southall remembers the problems of operating in the desert. Using his own video camera, he recorded himself and his day-to-day -day activities during the Gulf War. This is the war, the way we fought it. You're going to drink a gallon a day if you're just sitting in the shade, not moving, not doing anything. But to do any activity at all, just to walk anywhere, you've doubled it. If you're going to start digging holes like we were doing, you've tripled it to where you're going five to 10 gallons per day per man. You almost have to put an alarm clock on it. You know, 30 minutes, drink. I'm not thirsty, drink anyway. Because if you wait till you're thirsty, you're already dehydrated. That's your body telling you, you hey, I've already, I'm already overdue. We're going to dig the hole long enough for us to lay down in just barely wide enough for us to get in. Mike Southall is now a trainer at the U.S. Army Proving Grounds in Arizona. Well, what we're going to end up doing is putting a cover over the top. He teaches basic survival techniques, like digging a foxhole to hide from the heat as well as the enemy. Hey, you want it into it? Turn this lip back. By putting two ponchos over the hole, the top one takes the brunt of the heat and the hot air from it is blown out through the cavity between them, 
It makes a safe, cool hiding place. Oh my God! Could you hang out there? Yeah, this takes the heat off real well. And it's tactical. Can't get shot. Exactly. <laughs> Artillery frags save from everything. Oh, man. The desert is unpredictable. Paradoxically, in a place where water is life, it can also mean death. More people have drowned in the desert than have died of thirst. When it rains, it is an awesome sight. Storm clouds gather overhead, vast, dense, and darkly violent. Trickles swell to torrents in minutes, destroying towns and claiming countless lives. More terrifying still are sandstorms. Thousands of tons of sand are sucked into the atmosphere. Hurricane force winds laced with sand particles can flay the body. Robert Parsons encountered a sandstorm in the spring of 1996 when crossing the Oryx Reserve in central Oman. He had decided to take a shortcut which would save him 375 miles of driving along the highway. Although from England, Robert Parsons worked for a Saudi-based engineering firm and was no stranger to the desert. He had adequate supplies of bottled water and a four-wheel drive vehicle. Soon after entering the desert, he was hit by a sandstorm. Billowing sand obliterated his wheel marks, making it impossible for him to retrace his tracks. Blasted by sand, the engine seized. Stranded, his only option was to sit out the storm. Repairing the vehicle was beyond his ability. He had no compass, map, distress flares, or radio. Even worse, some of his plastic water bottles had burst. Remaining calm and using the correct survival skills, he decided to attract help by burning his spare tire. He then wrote, help, in the sand, hoping an aircraft might see him. For 24 hours, he waited in the shade of his vehicle. Nobody came to his rescue. Finally, his water supply dwindling, he decided to try to walk to safety. He wrote a note, which he left in the car. Whoever finds this note, it is real hard to write this because I'm absolutely shit scared. After becoming disorientated in a very severe sandstorm, I have very little water left. And so I'm going to walk and see if I can reach the black top. I shall head in a direction front left of the car toward those low hills. If I don't make it, tell my wife, Claire, my young son, John, and my family that I love them and that I will miss them so much. Robert Parsons, Monday, 29th of April, 1996. His body was found three days later, less than 10 miles from the highway it was barely identifiable. The erratic power of the desert can never be underestimated. There are no shortcuts to safety. The desert is an untouched and tempting world in which you can stand and feel connected not only to yourself, but to the greater universe. Its exotic perfection is a kind of lure enticing the unwary, the unsuspecting. The Sonoran Desert near Yuma, Arizona may breathe with beautiful life, but it remains a dangerous landscape for the uninitiated. 
Mike Ban is a captain of the Yuma County Sheriff's Search and Rescue Department. He has saved countless people who have run into danger in the desert. Usually there are people that are just, they've had enough of town and they're bored and they were looking for something else to do. It can be anybody, it can be mom and pop, it can be two 17 year olds. The desert doesn't treat any one person bad. It just depends on whether you're intelligent enough to take enough enough equipment with you and enough water. Water is just absolutely the key thing. You just can't take enough. When you're driving in the desert, generally you need to have good wide tires and the air pressure down low so you get a nice footprint in the sand. A lot of people when they get stuck they leave all the air in the tires. If you let it down to around 12 pounds in the rear and 12 pounds in the front, you can just about drive through the majority of the sand. You can tell by the vehicle, it just becomes a part of you. It's like your fingertips. Sometimes you gotta let off the throttle a little bit. You can actually feel the vehicle just raise up out of the sand instead of digging its way through it when you get and putting power on it. Well, let's see, here's a nice looking cactus. A lot of people think that you can take and just cut this off, lift the top, scoop out some water, and you can't hardly get a cup full of water out of that. You can't even get enough moisture out of that to sustain your life. And these thorns, just to give you an idea, with a pocket knife you'd be that far into it before you'd ever even get to the meat of the cactus. So you'd have a real hard time trying to cut that off. Heat distorts the perception of distance in the desert. What appears to be only a short walk can, without water, turn into a fatal marathon. Mike Ban has come across numerous incidents where a short trip has turned into tragedy. We had three girls leave the college. About 45 minutes total after they left the college, they were stuck. One of the girls said, well, I'm gonna go for help, and she took off walking. That particular day, it was about 118 degrees in the shade. Uh, air temperature was probably around 124 to 128. Uh, she made it about a mile from the vehicle and she died. The second girl uh, went to look for the first girl and she made it about halfway and she died. The only uh, girl that survived was one that stayed with the vehicle and it was too hot inside the car so she crawled underneath the car. Uh, and then some gentleman come driving by a couple hours later and uh, found her, found the car with the doors opening and uh, the hood was up for the typical uh, help. And uh, they got her and as they drove down the road, they found the other two victims. By far the greatest number of people who get into difficulties in the desert are illegal economic migrants. In the past three years, over 1,000 Mexican citizens have suffered appalling deaths trying to enter the United States. The Imperial Dunes in southern Arizona form a part of the Mexican border. Migrants, often with no planning or knowledge of the terrain, attempt to cross the border undetected. They choose the desert because they mistakenly believe here they can most easily evade border patrols, which are tighter nearer towns and cities. Often ignorant of their route, with inadequate provisions and insufficient water, they set out across the desert, heading for the American dream. In 1996 alone, 1.5 million migrants were apprehended along America's southern frontier. 30,000 of those were picked up in Arizona. Inevitably, the number of fatalities is rising annually. Glenn Payne is a border patrol agent at Welton. The area that we're responsible for is like 118 miles. It starts in, actually starts in California and runs down to the other side of, uh, to about the middle of Arizona, roughly. The people that come in here are mostly from Mexico. But in the desert here, you've got anywhere from 30 to, to 60 miles of desert that you have to walk across to get from one safe spot to another safe spot. You take these sets of tires, they're, they're quite heavy, 
and we'll hook them up behind our vehicles and drag them, and in fact, just pull them through these drag roads, smoothing them out where it's, you can see ants walking across there if, if you really look. By doing that and keeping them clean like that, we're able to see most of the traffic that does cross it. Any illegal migrant hoping to cross this desert has first to cross a drag road. Border patrols have over 100 miles of drag tracks to check daily. By flying low and into the sun, the helicopter pilot, even at 80 miles per hour, can easily pick out the exaggerated shadows of footprints in the smooth sand. Like a hunter, he follows the tracks of his quarry. When he makes visual contact, he radios for ground assistance. If the apprehended migrant is suffering from severe dehydration, the emergency services are alerted. Corey Salisbury is a firefighter paramedic. She runs most of the ambulance calls around Yuma. By the time we find them, it has been probably several days, not hours, but several days that they have been in the extreme temperatures of this environment. And with that, they have passed all the warning signs, such as heat cramps and preliminary bouts of heat exhaustion. They're probably in the dire emergency states of heat stroke. With that, if you can think of the brain as, as having its own type of temperature regulation inside of it, that shuts down so they can no longer regulate their temperature and they begin to overheat. The most important thing after placing them in a cool environment is to go ahead and drench the body with normal temperature water over sheets that has been placed on the patient due to rapid, excessive cooling. The next step would be to place cold packs onto the various areas that absorb and have the most heat, such as under the arms, behind the neck, groin area, abdomen area. Then we want to replenish the internal part of the body with the fluids that have been lost. With this patient, it was quite excessive, so we want to do very vigorous, excessive IV therapy. And of course, oxygen was the number one step to go ahead and increase the circulation in the brain with the oxygen therapy. We have on board an approximate 18 to 20 year old male, chief complaint of possibly heat stroke, heat exhaustion. The desert's victims are brought here to the hospital at Yuma. It is the only facility of this size for 150 miles and specializes in heat-related illness. To keep pace with the numerous cases they receive, Dr. John Carson and his staff frequently work around the clock. In order to come to America, they, they risk trying to traverse miles and miles of, of the worst desert in America and um, it, it costs them their lives many times and costs them their health. Senor, se habla espanol? Si, si, con se nombre, ah? The most mild form of heat injury is heat cramps, and that coupled with heat exposure, being in a hot environment, but with having severe muscle cramps of the large muscle groups in your body. The more severe form is a heat exhaustion, and that is heat exposure, plus having severe dehydration. The most severe form is heat stroke, where a person becomes comatose and is very dehydrated and has a very high body temperature. The body temperature actually will go up to 105 or 106 degrees Fahrenheit, and the person is also dehydrated. That combination is many times lethal. I'm gonna put some cool towels on you here. It's gonna be, feel kinda of cold. Heat injuries can affect anybody of any age, but the elderly, it affects more than others. Children are very susceptible to heat injury, 
many times have too many clothes on and they get sun exposure, which increases the, the dehydration of the, the sunlight. In modern society, we are used to having air-conditioned vehicles, air-conditioned workplaces, air-conditioned homes and apartments and hotel rooms, and we forget that we're really just a few feet from disaster. Um, going out into the desert and then having your air conditioning break or your car break down, you are in a life-threatening situation. In today's world, deserts appear not only more accessible, but less daunting. Increasingly, our realities are virtual ones. The possibility of real death from actual dehydration and heat stroke seems improbable, if not unrealistic. Only a few hours flying time from Europe, Tunisia in North Africa offers guaranteed vacation sunshine and a fascinating tourist destination. In 1989, the Hughes family were among 30,000 Britons visiting Tunisia. Andrew Hughes had visited the desert here when he was only 19. Now in his 30s, he had returned for a family vacation with his wife, Jane, and their two boys, Matthew and Sam. Tiring of the hotel pool, they hired a car to drive to the market town of Douze in the Matmata region. Douze is situated in the southern half of Tunisia, close to the beautiful but desolate Chot el Jarid, the largest salt lake in North Africa. Famous for its camel market and as a desert trading post, it is surrounded by sand dunes and is often referred to as the gateway to the Sahara. Desert roads are rarely signposted, and maps of the desert are notoriously unreliable. Andrew Hughes took a wrong turn. When the car got stuck in the sand, they thought they were near their destination. They were not. They had no means of digging the car out, and so decided to continue on foot, thinking that they were not far from Dues, where they could find a tow for the rental car. They took with them only one and a half liters of water. After an hour of walking in the desert heat, they were quickly tiring. Jane said they could not go on. Andrew decided his wife and the boys should go back to the car and wait for him there. He would go on to Dues, which he now believed to be much nearer. All his family had to do, he said, was to follow their tracks. Bye-bye. I won't be long. Andrew Hughes was not unduly worried about his family. He had seen some water tanks by the roadside, and he was sure they could get water from them. He carried on alone towards Dues. By nightfall, the town was still nowhere in sight. There was no one to give him directions. The next morning, the sun threatened to exhaust the little energy he had left. He thought of his wife and children and forced himself to go on. After several hours of tortuous walking, he stumbled onto an isolated road. A Tunisian farmer was his salvation. Severely dehydrated, he greedily guzzled down his first drink for 18 hours. He and the farmers set out to try to find Jane and the boys. After two and a half hours, they found the abandoned rental car.
Andrew Hughes' worst fears were confirmed. There was no sign of the family, no relieved happy wife and children welcoming him, only the empty wilderness of the desert. Having recovered the car, Andrew Hughes followed the farmer to continue the search. After a short distance, the car ground to a halt once again. To his disbelief, the farmer's truck drove on. Whatever the reason or misunderstanding, he could only stand and watch as it vanished. One tire was flat. Then he discovered the rental car carried no jack. Once again, he was on his own, without water, without maps, and worst of all, without his family. There was nothing else he could do. He began walking again. Later that day, a violent sandstorm blew up. He took the only available shelter under some scrub. The sandstorm lasted 15 hours into the night. Something drove him on, a kind of panic, a mania to survive. For two days, Andrew Hughes had endured the worst punishment the desert could throw at him. By the next day, it had been 19 hours since he last drank. Yet the cruelest trick was about to be played on him. The water in the desert well was too far down for him to reach, and the rope had rotted. He collapsed, dehydrated and exhausted. Hours later, he was found by the Tunisian National Guard it was then he learned the terrible fate of his family. They never made it back to the water tank. Their bodies were discovered some distance from where they had abandoned the rental car. For centuries, we have endeavored to tame and shape our world. The desert is perhaps the greatest natural obstacle we still seek to conquer. We have diverted rivers and built canals to irrigate it, dug wells and constructed pipelines to carry millions of gallons of water across entire continents. We have brought life to its wilderness. Building roads into the desert, we have even settled there protecting ourselves with air conditioning, ultraviolet ray-proof glass, and humidity controls. In a land without water, we can take a swim. With the wonders of technology, we think we have achieved a victory over our environment. Our ingenuity has created miracles of survival, available at the flick of a switch. But what if it fails? Man comes into the desert and says, I'm gonna tame this desert. Uh, not unless he sinks a lot of wells while he's there and has access to a lot of water, he's not going to tame this desert. Uh, he has to have a lot of respect for it. This desert is just like electricity. As soon as you lose your respect for it, it will kill you. We all thought it looked pretty rugged, pretty frightening, pretty powerful. There was something so almost like, you might call it a hidden menace there, and one feels very small, uh, a little tiny small speck uh, in, in a massive area of sand dunes and rocks and everything else, which you know you've got to cross. Yes, it's a bit humbling, and you definitely feel the power of the desert. In surrounding ourselves with fragile technologies, we have created an illusion of safety and security. With the shrinking of our world, there is the belief that everywhere is accessible. But when you are lost in the desert, you are close to death. 
to live in harmony with these beautiful yet extreme environments, it is necessary not only to recognize the frailty of the human body, but to become intimate with the science of survival.